Hi, my name is Eric Lopresti. I'm here in my Brooklyn studio, and I'm here to give a talk um, for the Comparative Desert Imaginations Conference for Williams College, Massachusetts. Um, I actually gave this talk last week, but I wanted to re-record it because I had a little bit more to say, and also for people who couldn't make the conference. Uh, I want to thank Brahim El Guabli, Francesco Robles, and Jill Jarvis for inviting me. It really was a stellar um, set of interventions. People talked about the desert, uh, focusing mainly on the Sahara Desert, but some other deserts, thinking about the ecology, the history, and the culture as an artist. I wanted to give my take on how deserts have played a role in my artwork, as well as how I think about some of the darker sides of deserts that we think about, the layers of trauma, the way deserts record history, and sort of the things that happen in deserts in relationship to the way I think positively about um, coming out of uh, the year 2020, which we've all lived through. So let me start um, by talking a little bit about the desert I know. This is the Columbia Plateau and it is where I grew up. It's in southeastern Washington state, somewhere between the Cascades and the uh, Rockies or the Tetons, this vast open plain. Okay, it's not a desert, it's a steppe. I call it a desert because it is very large, it's very dry, it's very hot in the summer, cold in the winter, and it has all these artifacts of the sort of um, quintessential Martian lunar landscape we associated with a sort of featureless desert. When you fly over, you think nothing could ever happen there, but in fact, a whole lot has happened there. And I'm gonna talk through some of those historical events as a way of talking about um, sort of stratified layers of trauma and what we learn from them, the lessons we take, and the way I think about that playing into both my artwork and my vision of, of sort of how to be on this planet. Now, there are some um, marks here that some people might be noticing have been made by water. We're gonna to touch on that in a minute, but first I wanna talk about these marks. Uh, these are marks made by people. Typical of deserts, uh, we tend to put down sort of grid lines and architectural sort of plans on top of them. In this particular desert, on the eastern side, there are um, the sort of agriculture. You can see a lot of that up above, growing grapes, other sorts of um, foods. And down below, you can see something quite different. I'll sort of skip to the end. This is the Hanford site, notorious for being part of the Manhattan Project where the US Department of um, uh, Atomic Energy Commission made plutonium. In the middle there, that's the Columbia River. Now I grew up here, well, something like this. This is what a typical suburb looks like in the Western United States when you are in a desert. And uh, one of the things is that there's a lot of green grass. I don't know why we put green grass in the middle of the desert, but we do. And that sort of suburban like area really gave me a taste for what it was like to get out of town. This is what it looks like out of town looking north. And as you can see, there's this really big open area looks like almost nothing's there. And that is the Hanford site. Here's the Columbia River, which flows down through the Hanford site. And this is sort of the last wild stretch of the Columbia River. Most of the Columbia River has been dammed. I found out later that energy from Grand Coulee and other dams went to the Manhattan Project. And I thought that was fascinating to think about the way the American West has been industrialized in the 20th century. Zooming out, Rattlesnake Mountain in the background, some nuclear plants in the middle ground, and down below, it's very curious formations. When you view from an airplane, and this is a photograph I took from an airplane, the Columbia Plateau has features that can look a lot like sand washed up on a beach. And in fact, it's sort of what happened. I'm gonna switch over here to a little bit of um, history deep history. This is 20, 30,000 years ago, during the last ice age, a giant lake formed in 
Western Montana called Glacial Lake Missoula, and it was dammed up by ice, but the ice would cataclysmically fail every once in a while, sending a wall of water rushing through Eastern Washington state. That wall of water is why that landscape looks flat. And it happened multiple times, creating what they call a channeled scabland, um, what I think of as sort of the most beautifully bleak part of the United States and just very different than any other desert I've been to, and I've been to a few. Uh, you can see kind of Hanford down below underneath my cursor. And again, this is sort of what creates that Martian landscape. To add on to that, and I would say that is like sort of one of the layers of trauma, in that case, geologic trauma for this area. It's interesting to think that there might kind of have been people around at that time, so native uh, or, or first peoples of Americas came down uh, through the Bering Strait after or during the end of the last ice age. And shortly after the last flood, this skeleton appears. This is called Kennewick Man. It was found a couple miles from my high school on the banks of the Columbia River. And this is an artist's reconstruction of what he looked like. Kennewick Man, his um, tribe, his society lived in Eastern Washington during, uh, you know, the time from the last ice age up until quite recently. And that's another thing that we need to talk about as Americans, sort of original sin of depopulating the uh, North American indigenous societies. So did Kennewick man see the great floods? I don't know but the flood was enormous. Here are some sand dunes that are several meters high. I would call this uh, in relationship to other deserts like the Sahara or the Middle East, this is a biblical size flood in a land that had no Bible. And I think that's a good description of that part of North America. Okay, so fast forward a little bit to, this is a uh, image from 1906 of the Nez Perce uh, Indians, and these were the peoples that white settlers sort of ran into as they colonized the West, sometimes forcibly, very traumatically in all cases. And um, they were here sort of um, until the government uh, and, and, the, and the white settlers pushed them out, but then the government pushed out the white settlers as well in order to make Hanford. Hanford was part of the Manhattan Project. I'm going to talk about that now by way of this photograph. I would date this sometime somewhere in the 50s. So this is actually after Manhattan Project. And there's a lot going on here. Um, this is a Native American, I suppose, on a, a horse. Horse is not indigenous to this part of the, um, the world. Uh, so there's a lot going on in this photograph in terms of cultural overlays and history. This is the sort of history that I was taught uh, when I grew up here. It's not entirely correct, but I want to zoom in on one thing, which are the, um, who are these white people in the background? Why were they there? Well, they were there in order to do this. The Manhattan Project was the U.S. quest to build the atomic bomb. First exploded in Trinity and Los Alamos, then the Hiroshima bomb and the Nagasaki bomb traumatically ending World War II. After World War II, the bombing continued in the form of nuclear tests. Most of these tests took place uh, in Nevada. I'll talk about that in a second. And this is sort of the way we usually see um, atomic bombs as mushroom clouds. Now to make plutonium, which is the critical stuff that Hanford produced for those atomic bombs, uh, it requires an immense industry. In fact, you might say it had to kind of industrialize the entire country. There are, hundreds, there are tens of sites associated with the Manhattan Project, three secret cities, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Los Alamos, famously assembling the bomb. Hanford made the plutonium, the thing inside the thing that goes boom. And it did it through a vast landscape of government buildings, some of which are seen here. I think this is enormously important to understand how much of the West is militarized and how much was given over to the quest for military dominance, especially 
the sort of earth shattering, devastating and terrifying force of a talk bomb. Uh, Hanford made plutonium through the end of the Cold War. Cold War ended around 92, 93. And um, where, where did all that nuclear stuff go? Some of it went into weapons, but now I got to shift gears and tell you that a lot of the plutonium went down into test devices, which were exploded here. This is Nevada test site. And if you know it, you know it. If you don't know it, I'm about to blow your mind. This is about 80 by 40 miles of US militarized zone given over to the explicit testing of nuclear weapons. And I'm gonna show you where it is by going over to uh, Google Earth. So this is maybe 60 or so miles north of Las Vegas, switching to satellite view. I'm zooming in. See all these circles on the landscape there? Each circle represents an underground nuclear test. Now, I'll explain what an underground test is in a minute, but just know that these are between several hundred to 1,000, 1,500 uh, feet in diameter. They are absolutely ginormous. And the landscape is gridded off from north to south with over 900. Let me repeat that. There are 900 plus um, craters in Nevada where we as the United States effectively bombed ourselves <laughs> during the Cold War. During the Cold War, uh, well, in the course of history, there have been 2,427 nuclear bombs exploded on planet Earth. Uh, the Trinity test, two over Japan in wartime, the rest have been test devices exploded by the US or the Soviet Union. US Soviet Union tests stopped 93 and um, the remainder of tests to date have been in China, uh, uh, France, um, UK, and uh, North, most recently and most terrifyingly, uh, North Korea, a couple other countries in there as well. <clears throat> I'm not an expert on this thing, except to say that I look at a lot of images of Nevada test site and I think about it um, because it is just stunning. The level of engineering and creative effort that went into these devices. Why were they there? Why so many? How did we get through it without blowing ourselves up? Well, I want to start those big questions by looking at actually what they were, because it's a little counterintuitive. And if you think of an atomic bomb going off as a mushroom cloud, here's a place to recalibrate. That's not the image you should be thinking of. The image you should be thinking about is something like this. And this is an underground nuclear test taking place in the 80s in Nevada. For scale, I told you these things were big. That is a, is a pickup truck over to the right. That is what's known as a subsidence crater. When you do an underground nuclear test, you have to put the device underground. So you dig a hole straight down into the planet's surface thousand feet, something like that. Into that hole, which may be only a couple of feet wide, you place a miniaturized nuclear device. These things got quite small, which is part of their uh, terror. Put that down a thousand feet, cover up the hole, trail out some sensor wires, step back, way back, and light it off. When an underground nuclear bomb explodes, <clears throat> it vaporizes a sphere of rock roughly the size of several city blocks. Instantly turns the solid rock into plasma, at which point the top of the surface of the planet, the desert, sinks down, effectively forming a, uh, a kind of sinkhole. And here's another test of a, a different test, but you can see that recently the earth has sink, sunk and there is some smoke and dust retreat, um, going off the um, screen to the, to the bottom. And that's what an underground nuclear test really looks like. Sometimes they go sideways into mountains. Sometimes they put it so deep you can't really see them. But the important thing is all the action happens out of sight. 
you can't photograph an underground nuclear test. Where would you put the camera? It's in solid rock. And even if you did, the camera would be vaporized with the film. So there's no way, we have no images of this, not directly. And as a painter, as an artist, this is one of the paradoxes I find incredibly fascinating that some of the most powerful and destructive devices on the planet have never really been visualized. Except like this. And I think of this as the remains of the day. This is what the Western epicenter of the Cold War looked like. This is a nuclear landscape where we showed the Russians how powerful our devices were. And by the way, they have their landscape where they showed us. So a sort of visual, um, uh, a, a visual display of destructive military might. Okay, I wanna tell you one more narrative about plutonium, which is that not of all of it went into Nevada. Some of it went onto ICBMs. And some of those ICBMs went onto things like this. But what happens after the Cold War? 93, Cold War ends, nuclear submarines need to be decommissioned. Yeah, we still have some, but a lot of them got taken out of service. And what happens to not only the missiles, but like the reactor? That's a pretty dangerous thing. You can't just put that in a salvo yard. Well, what you do is you encase it in concrete, put it on a ship, and ship it up the Columbia River. And here's one of them going up the Columbia River um, now into a place called Trench 94. I found this place while flying over Hanford and taking photographs, and I was like, what is that? And it turns out that is a giant pit of every uh, naval submarine, nuclear reactor from every naval submarine in the U.S. fleet. There are something over 120 or maybe 150 by now in this pit. And your first question is, why didn't they bury it? And the reason they didn't bury it is because in order to satisfy certain treaties, the Russians and everyone else needs to be able to see that we've decommissioned that ship. That reactor is displayed here to show what we've taken out of action. By the way, the same thing happens for the Russians in their shipyard. Um, this is another way to look at the remains of the day, the aftermath of the trauma. And of the traumas uh, stories I've talked about, the Cold War is certainly the largest, affecting globally the planet for over 50 years, scared the bejesus out of people, including people in my uh, community, including me. So how do we process that? And the Cold War is sort of notoriously um, won or ended uh, without a major confrontation of nuclear weapons, thank God. But it still weighs in our collective psyche. And as Americans, we still kind of react in that sort of way. That's PTSD. -E. So I think as an artist of how we came out of that conflict and, and, and how that brought us to here. Now I make paintings, uh, I'm not actually a historian nor a psychologist, but I do paintings. And here's a painting of Trench 94 with um, two elements. Typical of my work, I juxtapose an abstract element with sort of rendering of the landscape. The landscape we talked about, it's in watercolor. This uh, painting is 50 inches by 38. And I need to tell you a little bit about the foregrounded abstraction. I call these color chips. They are as simple as they sound. And for me, they are allusions to the way that we and I look at images these days, which is often through digital devices. In my case, I use a program called Adobe Photoshop. And when I compose things, I'm always referring to these little color swatches. They're always in the corner. So I thought that should be part of the visuality I want to discuss. Now, I showed this painting at a exhibition at New Mexico State University a couple years ago. The exhibition was called Super Bloom. It included 40 works, very large gallery, very large space. Um, and I was happy to do that because New Mexico State University is a couple miles away from the Trinity test site where the first atomic bomb was detonated. It seemed appropriate. In the foreground is um, that Trench 94 painting. In the background are several oil paintings. 
I do usually paint in oils, sometimes in watercolors, and here's a mix of the two. For that show, I also showed a lot of images of or paintings of flowers. I wanted to talk about something creative in the desert, since I spent a lot of time talking about something destructive. The desert is very beautiful to me, and one of the beautiful, beautiful things is the way um, biological life forms adapt sometimes extremely inside of that harsh environment. So on the right are some Luisia flowers, Luisia rediviva. In the background are two paintings of cactuses. And another image of that show. What can an artist say about nuclear weapons? I don't have the technical skill of an engineer. I don't have the political or historical context of an academic. What could I, as sort of a lowly person pushing around dirt on a piece of canvas, have to say about these incredibly terrifying, incredibly large, world-changing devices? I would turn that on my head and say, as a citizen of the earth, as someone who grew up near the Hanford site, whose family was working on the site, whose every one of my friends had parents working on the site. Um, as an American, how could I not talk about these things? The way they make me feel, the thoughts they invoke in my mind, the reactions they um, prime me to for reacting to trauma. <clears throat> I think about color as a way to inflect the image. In this case, I've used some sort of color chips in the corners. Uh, this is my vaporwave palette to talk about inflecting this in a slightly more subtle way than your typical image of nuclear weapons. Now, I, I want to also go at this from a slightly more personal level because it's not just academic for me. In 1993, when I graduated from college, shortly after the Cold War ended, I uh, bought myself a mountain bike and I went on a long trek through the desert uh, by myself. My parents were out of town. My friends had not returned from school. <clears throat> and the desert is hot like uh, that, that summer. It was 110 degrees in the shade. So I probably dehydrated myself and very unsafely uh, took myself over this ledge and I wrecked. I wrecked catastrophically. When I came to, I was staring straight up at the sky and my helmet had been crushed. My bike was mangled. I was not sure why I had damaged, um, but I knew it was not good. And again, I was alone by myself, several miles out of town in the blazing heat. It turned out I had ruptured my spleen. Um, a spleen is an organ that processes blood. And if you rupture it, it means you're bleeding internally. So you can't tell what's going on. It's literally below the surface of your body. But you can get a sense that maybe it's not good because my vision started closing in and the way that happens when you start to pass out. But there I was staring up at the sky, the crystalline azure expanse of nature, of beauty. And there was the sun, the giver of life, or as I thought about it at the time, the nuclear furnace in the sky. So I had this experience of incredible trauma matched simultaneously with incredible beauty. And that juxtaposition of trauma with beauty has been with me ever since. I did eventually get myself to a hospital. I had my spleen out. Turns out you don't need it. And uh, I, I have ever since been thinking about that moment in the desert and what that means for the way we and I process these giant events. That bike wreck was uh, very important for my life. My life pivoted literally on that bike wreck. And as a nation, we've pivoted on traumatic events. In 2020, we had the COVID um, coronavirus pandemic. We had a global economic collapse. We had 
protests about race and policing, we had an extremely turbulent and traumatic political season, uh, all within the context of this giant, slow moving shipwreck that is climate change. It was a year of trauma, of cataclysm. I hope everyone who's watching this came through okay. I. I I know it's been a very difficult year. And through this, I think as an artist, I've thought a lot about what it means to come out of trauma. I actually really appreciate my bike wreck. It gave me something that I, I didn't have before. It gave me that experience of the sublime, the collision of beauty with terror. It gave me an impulse to live. It gave me a feeling of survival. Um, it gave me some safety tips for bike riding. And as an artist, it, it gave me sort of my, my interest in how do we talk about really big issues, even though we are these small, fragile creatures with limited sort of resources and reach. I think about nuclear weapons, and this is a painting of Nevada test site. Um, and I think that we have not yet incorporated that trauma. We, we don't really know what it means. Um, I have yet to meet someone who is not in favor of abolishing nuclear weapons, as am I, but yet here we are with them in our presence. We can't seem to get rid of them. And how do we live with that imminent threat, the, um, the danger of the, uh, the natural or the, the, the technological environment. Okay, I'm gonna to switch to a more recent body of work and then close. This is a painting from a body of work I'm calling Rocks and Tapes. Some of those paintings are behind me in the studio. This is a newer one. There's a couple little ones over there. Um, but I'll, I'll focus on this for a minute because it introduces some of the main themes of this body of work. First, there is a painting of a natural desert. This is actually on paper. There are watercolors, ink, acrylic, probably some spray paint, a lot of things. I throw the kitchen sink at it when I'm on paper. Um, and Joshua Tree, I, I love Joshua Tree, yet another desert. Embedded in there is a collaged element of a painting palette. That's a paper palette that I use to mix oils, oils like I use for these sort of paintings. And down below is a strip of the aforementioned color chips, which I think of as an allusion to digital and the way we tend to annotate things semi-arbitrarily these days using digital tools. Here's a larger painting from Rocks and Tapes. This is called Rocks and Tapes. It's seven feet wide, five feet high. It's oil and canvas. There's no photo transfer. There's no photography involved. This is uh, oil on canvas. And there are two layers of elements here. One is, as well, actually, it may be a little hard to see this. Um, the complexity is intentional. Uh, I think nature is incredibly complex and sometimes we have to train our eyes to see it. So I've grown to making these paintings that are a little hard to see. Uh, but sit with them, they'll come to you. The background, as it were, is a desert in California where there are some uh, sort of river stones strewn about with a cactus. I'll zoom in on the cactus. You can kind of see it with its spikes there. But in front of all this is this field of tape marks. They're supposed to be like um, masking tapes. They're actually made with masking tape, but they are not themselves masking tape. This is what we call trompe l'oeil. We've used, uh, I've used paint to sort of imitate a real object. And to give you a sense of what that looks like, I'm gonna zoom in on the side. So that's just tape, uh, sorry, that's just paint. Looks like tape. And you can see a little bit of the um, surface fracture of the painting. These two elements, the tapes and the rocks, come together to kind of form an all over field, almost like a Jackson Pollock painting. And again, I think about that as relating to the way we see or we need to see uh, the desert and the way we need to see the natural in sort of this um, 
peripheral vision activated way, uh, less narrative, more, um, more field-based and somewhat referring to data, the digital, uh, the colors. I get asked how I choose my colors. In this case, the colors are fairly arbitrary, but they do inflect the painting and they come from me as an artist, as a painter, I choose them. So this is part of my way of talking about um, bringing the studio practice into the landscapes. Also, tapes. Why tape marks them spe specifically? I, I've been painting tapes for quite a while as um, signifiers of my artistic practice. But uh, recently I realized that I had embedded in my memory seen a painting by the great artist Sylvia Plymac Mangold. Um, I seen a painting of hers at the Albright Knox shortly before my bike accident, really. And somehow I believe that painting has embedded itself in my mind and come out later in my career as I think about how to inject an abstract field over this natural sort of field and, and, and let the two live in sort of, um, sort of stasis. Here's another painting, oil on canvas, seven feet wide. This is the landscape around Trench 94. In, in this case, I think of the black tapes. And again, those are trompe l'oeil. They're not real masking tape. It's kind of referring to the way we label things with text. Uh, but in this case, the text has been redacted. I also really enjoy Jenny Holzer's recent uh, redaction paintings, if you're familiar with those. And a painting of Nevada test site. There's a ochre paint mark. A painting of cactus. This is a photograph I took in California. There's a lot going on. I do intend these paintings to be somewhat um, too complex to see at once. But if you kind of stare at it long enough, you'll see um, the cactus and some other uh, interventions here. One thing about painting, so there's an intervention. One thing about painting, you know, you paint every single one of these spikes and you realize, well, this kind of cute, banal little cactus is at war. <laughs> um, so every one of those spikes serves a purpose. And what may look like kind of a calm sort of rock garden uh, to us is for this cactus a uh, place of mortal peril and also a place where it deploys its flowers to attract insects. And this is a lesson about the desert and the juxtaposition of life and death and of creativity and um, destruction. Three paintings from Rocks and Tapes. This is not a triptych, each one of these is individual. And it's sort of of a formation I found in California, which looked like it was collapsing from the top left down to the bottom right. Again, a lot of complexity going on. The tape marks themselves are masked. So that's the raw canvas showing through and then outlined in pencil. And I'll close on this. This is called Geologic Color Crash. It's about five feet tall, oil on canvas. The colored tapes are overlaying a landscape, but this time the landscape has sort of been abstracted out and I'm thinking more about what are those feelings that we get from this sort of experience? Or what are those tools that inflect and change the way we can come out of something so traumatic in a positive light? Um, masking tape is used in the studio of every craftsperson or artist on the planet. And it's used for various reasons, very multifaceted. Um, I mentioned you can use it to cover things up or redact them. You can also use them to uh, tape, or you can use it to tape things together, to hold together the impossible as it were. And as I continue exploring this body of work called Rocks and Tapes, I'm thinking about the dramatic and cataclysmic near history in the context of the further history context of culture in my own personal life and how 
um, these tapes become a metaphor for, yes, how to hold it together. All right. Thanks a lot.